Uh, Kyle is a David R. Anderson director of the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Data Science Institute and a professor of physics, where he's established an open source program office. He's also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Machine Learning Science and Technology. Previously, he was a professor of physics and data science at NYU, where he also served as the executive director of the Moore Sloan Data Science Environment. Dr. Kramer developed a framework that enables collaborative statistical modeling, which was used extensively for the discovery of the Higgs boson. He's an advocate for open science, open source software, Software and shared cyber infrastructure. So with that, I will hand it to Dr. Kramer. Great. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Hopefully. Everything's good. So I'm going to get into it now by sort of giving, you know, kind of a big overview about high energy physics and the Large Hadron Collider, uh, just to kind of set the stage. Um, and I, I uh, the scale of the effort and the scale of the investment from kind of all around the world into a project which is really unique in that, uh, you know, one of the biggest scientific endeavors in history that's uh, motivated both by just kind of intrinsic human curiosity and also uh, for many people, you know, the, it's driven by the, the kind of belief that uh, uh, contributions to basic research end up having some positive impact to transfer and training in the workforce and things like that. And I think both of those elements are really important. Um, so this is a picture of the sort of the Large Hadron Collider outside of Geneva. Um, it's a 27 kilometer ring uh, that's uh, buried underground, but it straddles the border between Switzerland and, and, and France. And it's roughly the size of a city. So it's a, this uh, enormous, uh, enormous thing. Uh, this is what the tunnel looks like underground long array of super connecting magnets and there's a kind of cutaway so you can see these uh, beams of protons inside that get accelerated to very, very high energies. Uh, and then they come into co uh, collisions in the middle of these huge uh, particle detectors, which are the, like the size of experiments. Um, this, is the si this is a picture of the Atlas experiment, which I'm a member of. And you, if you look at the bottom, you see a, a person here to kind of set the scale. This is what instructed. Uh, you can see superconducting magnets and all sorts of things. Uh, now, every nook and cranny of the experiment is filled with electronics, um, so you don't have a view like this anymore. Um, and we, on the other side of the ring, is our kind of friendly competitor, uh, CMS. Uh, ironically, the C stands for compact, even though the experiment is also absolutely massive. And you get a better feel in this photo for all, all the electronics. That are uh, <clears throat> filled in all the di different holes uh, uh, throughout the experiment. Um, so these experiments are, are uh, you know, don't happen by themselves. They happen because of huge collaborations. Um, so this is a, a collaboration photo of the CMS collaboration. This is not everyone. There are I mean, a few thousand people on the CMS collaboration. Um, so this is just the people that they could get together at, at that particular time. And, and here's a, a, this uh, collaboration of a at a workshop that we held at uh, NYU a few years ago. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that when these collaborations uh, write papers, we write all thousand, you know, all 3,000 authors sign the paper. Um, and so there is a the sociological aspect of, of doing science in the setting is really uh, uh, very important. Uh, and it requires, you know, a lot of consensus building. And there's also I think sometimes move a little bit more slowly than you would hope. Um, but uh, this is just kind of the reality of doing uh, big science in this way. Um, so there are other big numbers in addition to the people. When you think about the actual experiments, um, there, are, there have been about 40 quadrillion collisions uh, at the, the Large Hadron Collider, which is a number that's pretty hard to wrap your head around. Um, uh, the, uh, that's led to uh, an enormous space yesterday. Atlas announced that we hit uh, one exabyte of data that's being managed, uh, which includes both real data and simulated data. Um, to analyze this data, there have been billions of jobs, uh, you know, computing jobs that have been uh, submitted mainly to the worldwide computing grid. Um, and this has uh, led to thousands of scientific papers and thousands of graduate students being trained. Um, so it's just a gargantuan effort. What one of these collisions looks like um, so the, this is, a, you know, it's a computer visualization, but uh, these kinds of things can be visualized from the real data. So imagine uh, one of these kind of snapshots of, what, uh, of a collision, uh, but there are 40 quadrillion of them. 
uh, at 40 quadrillion is not a number that we're kind of used to dealing with. Um, so uh, one quadrillion is roughly how many grains of sand it would take to fill an Olympic cycle. So maybe imagine 40 of these swimming pools uh, with an enormous amount of sand. And when we're looking for something new in the data, you know, people talk about it as a needle in a haystack problem, uh, but it's a very it's a very large haystack. So I think maybe this is a better better analogy. And what we're looking for oftentimes are just very very few rare events, which would be something like uh, you know a thousand say uh, unusual collisions, which would be sort of like a thousand on this hand uh, that have been mixed together in the middle of the swimming pool, and you're trying to find them. So the so the challenge of, of going through all that data to find these uh, unusual events is uh, is basically what we're what we're dealing with. Um, so this is sort of the same thing in a more technical way. Uh, the the collisions happen 40 million times a second. The detectors have roughly 100 million sensors. Uh, so the data rate uh, coming off the detector is just absolutely insane. Uh, and then we're looking for signals inside of that data. Uh, that have a sort of signal to background ratio of something like 10 to the minus 10. So these, this is a, a logarithmic scale here uh, that's even cut off. So you have sort of 10 orders of magnitude between your, your average collision and the things that we're kind of looking for that are particularly interesting. Um, in the process of doing that, the, the data processing is sort of broken into roughly two stages. There's raw data that comes in and there's some bulk data processing uh, that reduces to a much smaller uh, 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 analysis data, uh, which is more kind of convenient to work with for uh, for most uh, uh, most of the physicists. And then uh, from that point, then there are many different analyses on that analysis data that are targeting targeting different uh, scientific questions. Um, and so there's there's a bunch of different there's a lot of variation in what this looks like, and it's typically done by groups of you know 10, 20, maybe 50 people uh, for per analysis. Um, now, the first part of this process is pretty well managed. Uh, the bulk data processing, you can think of kind of like uh, the Swiss trains that's like on schedule, very organized, very managed by professionals. Uh, but this end user analysis and, and contrast is much more kind of bespoke uh, ad hoc approach of like sticking together different tools. At least traditionally, that's how it's been uh, because there's a lot of variation. Um, and it's certainly not managed in, in quite the same way. And this last part is really the focus of this talk. Um, so let me try to give kind of a, a motivating example so you can kind of have a feel for what the data analysis looks like. So this example is motivated by the Higgs boson, but you don't need to know anything about it and that you can you, you know kind of abstract it to some, some other uh, situation. Uh, but in these collisions, we produce a, a lot of junk that we don't really care about. That's the yellow stuff. Um, but in addition, you know, hopefully we're producing something interesting, uh, which is usually an unstable particle uh, like this particle H. Um, and that unstable particle never hits our detector. It decays almost immediately. And oftentimes it decays into other unstable particles like this green Z particle here. And then those particles, uh, when they decay, they often you know, decay into something that is, uh, will actually hit our detector, something we'll actually see. And those are the red lines uh, led, labeled L. So, um, so then now think about if you only got to see the four red lines labeled L, like what would your strategy be for going through all this data to try to find evidence for this thing that we're ultimately interested in, the H at the beginning. Um, so here's an actual example from a collision that was taken in June of 2012. Um, and it actually has these four red lines. Those are muons or the specific particles in that case. And it's very rare to have a collision at the LHC that produces four muons. So the first part of the strategy is basically uh, go through all the data and filter on all of the collisions where you see you know, evidence for having these four red lines in it. Um, so that gets rid of most of the data, but then you still have quite a bit left over. And, uh, and what do you do from that point on? So what we usually want to do is take this very complicated data and somehow figure out if there's a way we can characterize it with just one or maybe a few numbers uh, that are going to be uh, sort of sufficient for whatever kind of statistical tests we want to do later. And so those, we call those features or observables, statistician might call them a summary statistic, but something that's going to help us distinguish the signal that we're after from the, the background uh, that we don't really care about so much. So what's an example of how you might do that? Um, you've probably heard, you know, Einstein's E equals MC squared. Um, that's not actually what Einstein said. There's, uh, that's only true if the particles aren't moving. 
if the particles are moving, then there's also a momentum piece. So you have sort of energy squared looks like mass squared plus momentum squared with the appropriate speeds of light uh, constants in there. Um, and then if, you know, probably most people in this audience uh, know that uh, energy and momentum are conserved. So even though we don't see uh, the Higgs particle directly, whatever energy it had was transferred into the energies of the particles it decayed into. And similarly, whatever momentum it had transferred into the momentum of the particles that it decayed into. Um, so, uh, so then you can use these the equation at the at the top and kind of rearrange it. And so, even though the energy and momentum vary from collision to collision, if you solve for the the quantity m there, the mass, uh, if you're actually producing Higgs bosons, you should basically get the same number every time because the Higgs has a particular mass. Um, and so, if you solve for that, you can kind of plug everything in. And you can uh, take something that from the observed data is a, a, plant, a quantity you can actually, uh, you know, plot. So here's a histogram of that quantity. So you just have one number per collision, uh, you histogram it, and what you see is the blue histogram is kind of this background from processes that we already knew about. And the, so that's like the null hypothesis. And then what we're hoping to see is evidence for something on top of that, uh, which would be, for instance, something like this red histogram. Uh, which was what you would predict if you were, for, for instance, producing a Higgs boson. And then the question is, what is the, what do you see in the data? And those are the black dots. And the exciting part is in the data, you actually see evidence for this bump. So that's the kind of the, the first evidence that you, you, you know, you see of that we actually are producing a Higgs boson. Now that's not the whole story. And so I want to kind of get into uh, this, this topic of collaborative statistical modeling. So, um, so I just told you the story of the plot on the left. Um, but it turns out that the Higgs could also decay in other ways. So instead of into unstable particles that I called Z, it could also uh, decay into stable particles like photons. And those photons will hit your detector. And here I labeled them G, uh, um, and that's the kind of light, uh, light blue G. Um, and so when you do an analysis for that thing, you have a totally different set of backgrounds. They're, the filters look different. Uh, uh, the, the, the details and the variable that you calculate are different. Um, and so you get a very different looking plot, but there's a fe feature in that, um, and which is again a bump. And if you're, if you're actually producing a Higgs, the bump in this plot and the bump in the other plot should match up. And, and so the theory, the fact that we have an underlying theory allows us to kind of relate what we would see in multiple different plots. So it's not just that we have two, we have lots of them. So we can have dozens and dozens of uh, plots like this that we make that are different subsets of the data that are, you know, we're plotting different features, but the underlying theory relates all of them. And so what we'd like to do is combine all of this together in a statistical way uh, and try and get the most out of the data at LHC. And remember, each of these plots is an entire team of people that's working for, you know, years to try to make, uh, bring together all of those ingredients. So the way that this was typically done uh, was really top down and was very centralized. And from a software point of view, it was very tightly coupled. It required a lot of coordination between the groups. And as a result, it moved very slowly and the whole approach was pretty rigid. And so we wanted, as we went into the LHC, we wanted to try to approach this in a sort of different way. So uh, we were using at the time, a C, you know, we'll still do use a, a C++ analysis framework called Root. Um, and, uh, but this is going back, you know, to 2007-ish time. And we were thinking about, uh, you know, how could we improve things? And so in addition from moving our version control from CVS to SVN, uh, and then later to Git, uh, we were also thinking about how we could solve this uh, collaboration problem. Um, so one of the ideas that came up, which is maybe seems obvious now, which, but it was kind of a not so obvious at the time and was a, a big conceptual shift, was to move away from the centralized model where Every, we have to kind of bring all the software for all the different analyses together and kind of compile it into one, you know, cutable um, and, and try and instead move to a more distributed model where the different teams uh, could work more loosely coupled and then share some digital artifacts that would be sufficient for the, the latter stages. And, uh, and so we realized at some point that we could uh, serialize these statistical models, uh, and uh, that was not so easy at the time because these were kind of very complicated data structures written in C++, but that was one of the things that Root was good at. And so we were able to do that, and then we could share uh, these uh, statistical models more easily. And so what we ended up developing was both a, like a statistical formalism, a specification, and a software implementation that allowed us to combine statistically the evidence from these multiple data sets um, in the middle, you see just kind of a formula, kind of general purpose statistical formula, 
and the on the bottom is a plot of the kind of computational graph at, at some point in time uh, that uh, takes all the data and then you know computes the likelihood of the data given the theory, uh, which is what you use for the statistics in the end. Um, so when we introduced this technique, it allowed us to very quickly scale up. So we saw a, a very quick growth in the number of data sets that we could combine, the number of modeling components that went into them, the number of parameters and the likelihood functions. Um, and this was really exciting and was really key to our ability to claim the discovery of the Higgs back in 2012. And so here's a, a plot, instead of showing the Nobel Prize, I'm showing the, the room when the announcement was made, because I think it's a little bit more centered on the people that made it happen. Uh, but this was really, you know, a triumph uh, for humanity as a whole and certainly for the experiments in a very exciting time. Now, after the discovery, we weren't done. The LHC was not just about discovering the Higgs. We were doing lots of different things. Uh, one of the things we want to do is study the properties of the Higgs very carefully to see if it's what's actually predicted in the standard model. But we're also searching for lots of other things like supersymmetry and dark matter and stuff. So when we study the Higgs in detail, we make plots that look like this. And I'm not going to go through it other than to say that the blue dot in the middle refers to the standard model. The axes are sort of parameters of a theory that allow you to move away from the standard model and describe slightly different theories of how particle physics might work. And then the, the contours are measurements that we're making from the data. Um, and so these were really important plots. And one of the problems at the time was that the way that we published our results, that the, the consumers of these results wanted to, for instance, uh, be able to reproduce these, these plots, and they couldn't. When they tried to take the kinds of information that we provided them and tried to reproduce those plots, they, they couldn't really reproduce it. And that was a, that's a problem, because these are like the most important kinds of plots for, for the field. Um, in addition, all these searches for other things like dark matter and supersymmetry and black holes and things like that were, were, uh, were having um, with their all, essentially all null results, which we're comfortable with as a field. We publish a lot of null results. Um, but the problem was that there were a lot of people out there thinking about, well, I have a slightly different idea. And I'm curious, like, would you have seen, you know, uh, the, the, you know what I'm predicting in my theory? And there was a huge unmet need for trying to reinterpret the results of the coming out of the LHC. To, and because that you know, need was being unmet, there were a lot of questions that were unanswered. And essentially, you don't know the problem is that you don't know if you're not sensitive to it or if the particle is just not there. And, and, you, and, and you need to be able to answer that question. So this is sort of the state of the field going back about 10 years ago. Um, to try to, we had an idea around that time that it would be great if we could build a service uh, so a kind of reinterpretation service where people outside of the experiments that don't actually have access to the data uh, could ask a question uh, and then go through a kind of well-vetted scientific pipeline and be able to get back uh, an answer to their question to see if their theory is still allowed or if it's been excluded by the data at the LHC. Uh, but this, this was just an idea 10 years ago we weren't actually doing. Um, so the other kind of ways of where we were one is just to say in terms of incentives, again, that first part of the data processing stage was like respected and it has, was given resources and incentives and it was well managed by dedicated professionals. But the end user analysis was not. Uh, it was considered sort of the fun part uh, and not really incentivized. And as a result, it neglected the need for really high quality and specialized tools that would be used by lots of people. Um, it was really kind of the wild west uh, there was a lack of harmonization that led to a very kind of inefficient process. Um, and also the analysis code was rarely preserved and the results were difficult to reproduce or reinterpret. And so none of that was good from the science side. Um, Root, which was this kind of general purpose analysis framework that was used by almost everybody, uh, was useful um, and it was technically open source, but it had a very small development team with very few contributions from the community. Um, and overall, I think you could just say that our tool, we were kind of siloed and our toolkit was not aligned with what you saw in industry or what was going on in data science or, or other areas of science for that matter. And so we was a desire to try to improve that alignment, which would allow us to kind of leverage the tools that were being developed by the broader ecosystem. It would help our graduate students, you know, get jobs as they enter the job market. And it would also help kind of better appreciation of PEPs value to society. Um, so going back to about 2014, um, there was a there was a, 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 a an effort to try to change that, and we were awarded some funding from the NSF uh, to uh, establish a new software uh, uh, effort aimed at an upgrade for the Large Hadron Collider with an approach that was more aligned towards Python and data science. 
Um, and so uh, on the left is a, 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 a grant that we got called Diana HEP that went from 2014 to 2018. And then that got upgraded to a full-fledged software institute from the National Science Foundation that started in 2018. And we just got renewed for another five years. And here, I'd just like to give a shout out also to the program manager, uh, Bogdan, uh, who, uh, who worked with us in this process and is really kind of a, a supporter uh, as we try to figure out how to navigate this kind of something at this scale. Um, so now when we think about end user analysis, we talk about it more as an ecosystem of analysis tools. Um, and so here's a kind of plot going from that analysis data through to the final results, including the ideas of re, uh, uh, reuse, uh, reproducibility, uh, analysis preservation, all of these kinds of things. You see the kind of uh, ecosystem of tools that are, that are emerging for the different parts of this uh, uh, analysis uh, process. And, uh, and it's been really a lot of fun uh, to be working on this. So, um, so a, many of these projects, not all of them, sit under a kind of broader umbrella called scikit Um And this is just like a complete transformation of how the field approaches software. Uh, it's very much embracing you know, uh, community uh, uh, contributions, doing a lot to try to engage uh, everyone to have those you know, developer contributions of different, si uh, of different kinds. Um, uh, there's a lot of embracing best practices of all sorts. And you see this really kind of like, you know, the, you know a lot of projects that are affiliated to scikit -Hep, Um, And it's a really kind of fun to see this transformation. Um, now, when we think about like, what, do, what does HEP look like in the broader scientific ecosystem, whether that's kind of Python or just more, more generally, uh, until recently, you know, HEP was not very well integrated or represented in that broader scientific Python or scientific software ecosystem. Here's this kind of famous plot on the left uh, that shows a lot of different packages. And probably the closest thing is something like AstroPy, uh, but you don't see any contributions from high energy physics here. Um, we were pretty excited when the num focus, I'm sorry, the NumPy paper came out uh, that had kind of a similar paper. Uh, and there you actually see scikit hep as being mentioned. Um, so this was very, you know, was a lot, made a lot of people happy. I will, you know, quibble that I don't think this is necessarily the right place to put scikit hep. It's really kind of a, um, an umbrella of a lot of different packages. Um, it's probably more similar to AstroPy in that respect, uh, but it has many very application specific components, but it also has things that are more foundational, uh, even at the level of something like NumPy, which we'll, we'll hit on uh, later in the talk. So now I just wanna kind of hit some highlights of, of, uh, of different you know, projects that are kind of happening as, as part of this uh, whole effort. Uh, and I'll go back to start with by thinking about that kind of uh, uh, the statistical side of, uh, of the toolkit. Um, so one of the tools that was used, that's kind of widely used, is something called His Factory, which was originally written in C++ and distributed with that root uh, uh, analysis framework that I mentioned before. Um, when we designed this thing, uh, we we uh, for you know for you know I don't know how much it was on purpose. I mean, when we thought of it, we were trying to think about how to make it easy to distribute the work across lots of different people, and we ended up basically saying it would be nice if we could just use an XML kind of declarative specification to uh, get all the inputs from all the people. And then we have a very clear transformation that's with very clear mathematics behind it uh, for what statistical model that will build. Um, and that was uh, very useful. Um, and but what we didn't realize is how useful that would be uh, to kind of separate the implementation from the specification until later. Um, so, uh, so say around 2014, 2015, when we were starting up this new effort, uh, that was around the time that like TensorFlow and the different AI machine learning uh, frameworks were being announced. And kind of immediately we realized that, it, you know, that there are lots of features in these frameworks that would be very helpful for our, our statistical tools. For instance, things like automatic differentiation and the various debugging tools um, and uh, ability to use GPUs. So we started very quickly to see if we could like migrate some of our statistical tools into these different frameworks. Uh, one of the early packages here was uh, something called PyHF, which stands for the like Pythonic version of His Factory, um, and that uh, project matured very rapidly. Uh, so this was a project that Matthew, Jordan, and Lucas kind of really uh, were the core developers for. Um, and uh, there's a JAWS paper about it, and and, uh, and I think it was the first of our projects that be, uh, got a num focus affiliate status. Um, and so this has really been a big success story. Um, and one of the things that happened along the way was that when we wanted to uh, share these digital artifacts and write them into a file, 
that we moved to a different serialization format. So instead of using root, we just use JSON. And somehow that technical change also changed a lot of attitudes uh, and it made it uh, somehow easier to convince people that we should be publishing these things. And so uh, a few years ago was the first time that we actually started publishing these statistical models. And this was highlighted on the CERN homepage, which was a really exciting moment for a lot of us that have been working on it. And this has been a dream of the field for almost 20 years. So, so this was really exciting. Um, shortly after, there were some papers saying like, you know, we should really do this more, more broadly. Um, and now that's happening. So if you look at a, a data repository that stores a lot of the kind of high level analysis results called HEP data, uh, you can actually filter by uh, entries there that are these his factory statistical models and now you see things like PyHF getting you know the number of citations is, uh, is rising very rapidly uh, and the use is, is ramping up and so this is just like been very exciting to watch uh, unfold um, once you publish those things now there's a, a new ecosystem of tools about using them so here's a, a tool called cabinetry that Alex held is the kind of primary developer on and this is just a 27 line script that downloads one of these, uh, you know, uh, digital artifacts from uh, uh, a repository that like HEP data, and then uh, uses it to refit the model to the data and do some visualization and you get plots like this uh, that are being, you know, reproduced just like in the paper from those digital artifacts. And so this is really exciting and the kind of stuff that the field has been hoping to see for, you know, for many, many years. Um, we're also seeing the uh, implementations uh, come up in Julia. Also, I think there's one in Go. Um, so it's really nice to see that this kind of separation into a specification and implementation is really taking off. And there's also ideas of trying to extend this to other kinds of statistical tools. Um, and so this is all just very exciting. Okay, now I'm gonna switch to another uh, topic, which is about thinking in arrays. And it's kind of the move to columnar data. That's the phrase that we use a lot Another phrase here is to kind of move towards array oriented programming. Um, and so this, uh, so I talked earlier about the first stage of this bulk data processing. So let me just say a little bit about that. Um, the, the, the raw data is you know, very, very complicated. You have roughly hundred million sensors on the detector. The data is very sparse. And so it's not very convenient to work with and it's just too low level. Um, so we run algorithms as part of this bulk data uh, processing that try to look at the energy deposits and identify, oh, there was this kind of particle here, there was that kind of particle there, um, and then try to characterize them in terms of their energy and momentum and things like that. And then you can write out a, a much smaller uh, data set, which is more useful for analysis. Um, but in that, in that new format, the thing is that the number, the data shape is not constant. The number of particles varies from collision to collision. And so the output is no longer like tabular data. It's now some kind of nested variable length data structure. And so, um, so this is the kind of thing that Root was very good at dealing with, uh, but we didn't really have something like that in Python. And so Jim Pavarsky has been the kind of the lead developer of Awkward Array, which is specifically aimed at analyzing this type of nested variable size data uh, uh, that you see using NumPy like idioms. Um, and so he talked about it at this uh, tutorial thinking in arrays earlier this week. Um, this is actually an example he used uh, where you see, uh, excuse me, uh, like a data set that has a, a bunch of records. And for each record, if you look at the field called Y, it's a, itself a list that's variable in size and sometimes empty. And so you might, for instance, want to do some analysis task like get all of the entries Y, uh, ignore the, the first element, um, and then take the remaining elements and square them all. Uh, this is just a made up example. Uh, but here you can achieve that with one line uh, using awkward array, um, and that, that produces this kind of output. If you wanted to the same kind of transformation on the data with kind of Python and a kind of loop-like approach to it would look something like this with sort of three nested loops. Um, as we all know, these kinds of nested loops in Python generally are pretty slow. Um, they also, and compared to the awkward array, it uses a lot of memory. Um, so I'm not saying that, you know, the, the point here is that not so much that uh, you don't want to do this in raw Python. The more important point is that this kind of loop-based approach is actually what physicists are used to doing uh, though usually that code is in C++. So performance is not necessarily so big of a problem there, uh, but the way of thinking about how to write the analysis is more loop oriented. And so this move to array oriented programming is a big cultural shift. Um, also just like to uh, make a call out here, not, not to spend any time on it, but there are efforts underway to try to play nice and have awkward work uh, natively in Julia. 
Um, and so just uh, kind of pointing to that work, which is, uh, which is exciting. Um, now, moving a little bit to this kind of within this group that's trying to, you know, develop this new ecosystem, uh, we have all these different tools and they should somehow fit together. And we, of course, think about how to make them be interoperable. Uh, but without a little bit more dedication to try to really make that be the case, uh, it's not going to happen. So we've been thinking about, like, how can we, uh, you know, facilitate that these different tools actually work together well and uh, can be integrated to actually solve a real scientific problem. And so a few years ago, we really embraced this idea of, of organizing grand challenges where we try to say, like, here's a really, you know, a challenging problem that we want to do. And to, uh, to tackle that problem, we're going to have to integrate all of these different tools uh, together. And so we, we have various kinds of analysis examples that we try to do. And so this is one analysis example that includes machine learning pieces, um, includes almost everything in the technology stack that I've talked about. Um, a big shout out to Alex and Oksana who have led this analysis grand challenge. And this has been super helpful at us actually kind of finding all the rough edges and make sure that these tools actually work together. Um, one thing that we're trying to do here, which is a stretch goal, is to see if we can make this entire analysis pipeline differentiable, which requires using automatic differentiation and passing uh, derivatives uh, and gradients from one tool to another that may be written in a slightly different way. And so that's like a very, very difficult, uh, challenging uh, from a technical point of view, and has really helped us kind of work together very closely. Um, another uh, grand challenge that we've had recently is just about, can we actually run these things on facilities at scale and process as much data as we'd like to. Uh, so we have this one challenge, which is to process 100 billion events in 30 minutes. So that's a 55 megahertz event processing rate. But you have about two kilobytes per event data payload. So that's about 200 terabytes of data that we want to process in 30 minutes. Um, the analysis code can run at that 55 megahertz if we have a, an analysis facility with about 2,000 cores. So we're trying to see, can we take that data and distribute it to 2,000 cores using things like DASK um, uh, effectively. And so the plot on the right shows, you know, using thousands of cores and maintaining that sort of uh, uh, 200 gigabits per second data rate, uh, which is pretty, uh, this is all very recent, it's happening now. Uh, and as a big challenge, it's really bringing people together and exposing lots of rough ends. Um, uh, some of this was highlighted. This is just another call out in, uh, in uh, 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 Vangelis's uh, uh, talk earlier, I think on Wednesday, about using this sort of uh, ecosystem of tools to answer questions in uh, particle physics. Uh, so just a shout out there. I wish I had more time to talk about it. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to this kind of last part of the, uh, of the analysis, which is about analysis preservation and reuse. Um, so I mentioned earlier this kind of example that, okay, once we publish these results, maybe it's a null result, and there are many people that are outside of the collaborations that would like to ask questions uh, that, uh, that normally you can only answer if you're within the, within the experiment. And we're trying to see if we can change that a little bit and open things up a bit. Um, so, um, so instead of just trying to say, okay, let's make all the data open and start from scratch, we really, you know, that's a, a, a strategy uh, but we, we're really thinking about, can we get more value out of the uh, analysis pipelines we already have? And so the basic idea here is that if you built an analysis pipeline that was aimed at hypothesis A, using something like the, what I described before, you might get a plot like the one on the left. Um, and so you see some background pieces and the signal piece is this red bump. And you see the data does not look like it prefers that red bump. So you, you're actually excluding this hypothesis. You're saying this data you know, is ruling out this hypothesis Thank you for your contribution, but that's not what nature chose. Um, but someone else might say, okay, well, I have a different idea, um, and I, I don't know if my idea hypothesis B is still val valid or not. Um, and that hypothesis B is similar to hypothesis A, but different in details. So if you could push hypothesis B, make the, you know, simulate that signal and push it through the analysis pipeline, you might get uh, the green bump on the left, which is, you know, not like the red bump. But, uh, but it's still kind of, you know, you would see a bump if the, if the data, if the, you're actually producing that particle, you, the data would look different than it actually does. So in this example, you can also rule out hypothesis B and without a lot of extra work because you're just reusing that analysis pipeline. So that was the idea from a long time ago um, and it took a lot of effort to get there. So we worked on uh, for many years, like analysis, uh, uh, sorry, workflow languages that, that kind of met our needs. Um, and we wrote a paper called Open is Not Enough, basically saying that just making the open data is, is, is great, but uh, what we should really also focus on is preserving these analysis uh, uh, pipelines so that we can reuse them because they have a lot of scientific value. 
And in the process, we developed this uh, tool called Rihanna, which is really like a framework for taking those workflows that can be expressed in different workflow languages and then executing them either on the cloud using something like Kubernetes or on HPCs with Slurm or on grid-like resources with Condor, uh, leveraging things like Docker and Singularity and different containerization technologies. Um, so to get there, like we really needed to convince the community that it was worthwhile. One of the big changes that was really important was to kind of change the narrative from reproducibility, which is kind of backwards looking, to reuse, which is enabling new science. And so we finally got like pretty good uptake and you see some of these nice training events, teaching people how to use, you know, build containers and create reusable workflows. And so now we have this library of analysis pipelines and we're starting to use them. So the idea here is on the left, you have this analysis pipeline. On the right, you have the parameter space of some theory. And what we do is we say, do like a kind of naive grid scan through this theory's parameter space. And for each point, you can simulate what the data would look like, push it through this analysis pipeline, test that hypothesis, and see if that theory is still allowed or if it's been excluded. Um, so this is kind of the simple way to do it. Uh, as you can tell, that kind of grid-based approach is not very efficient. So we started using active learning and different kind of AI techniques where we sit on top of these automated pipelines and we try to be smart about our use of computational resources. And so we actually have active learning techniques that are trying to uh, quickly figure out what is the boundary between the allowed and the excluded regions uh, and sitting on top of these uh, computational workflows. And that's some pretty cool work. Um, we've also been seeing, can we scale these up to some of the most challenging problems that previously we just basically couldn't really do. So uh, recently in the last year, uh, Atlas put, uh, put out a kind of tour de force using this technology where we're scanning through a theory of supersymmetry that has 19 parameters that you can jiggle um, and, uh, and so on the plot on the left shows the scaling of, uh, can we scan through this 19 dimensional parameter space with tens of thousands of uh, samples of different theories and then uh, reinterpret them. And the plot on the left shows doing that at scale using Google Cloud or on CERN computing resources on thousands of cores. And the plot on, plots on the right show the set of uh, theories that were uh, investigating originally and the number that are still survive after being confronted with LHC data. So this is really like, you know, pretty impressive and kind of a, a realization of a vision that we've had for like a decade. Um, you could of course wonder like, oh no, not another analysis workflow. Uh, don't worry, we're also trying to avoid that. And so we're doing things like trying to bring the communities together to understand what the state of the art looks like, what our needs are and, uh, and how we can kind of, uh, uh, you know, avoid duplication as much as possible. Okay, so the last topic that I want to hit is on simulation-based inference, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, simulation-based inference is like a really, really exciting project. Uh, that from my point of view, like the work that I was doing in this area was motivated originally from particle physics. And we were just thinking, okay, we have this very high dimensional complicated data on the experiments. And ultimately what we want to do is make some statistical statement about the parameters of some theory. Um, and uh, how do we do that in an efficient way? And I showed you how we did that in the traditional way where we built these histograms and we had these analysis pipelines I showed you and we tried to engineer these uh, features of, uh, 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 that we're going to, to histogram and things like that. And so the idea though in that process is that we have a simulation chain. The reason that we can simulate the hypotheses, we start with these theory parameters. We use things like you know Feynman diagrams, we can simulate things like the parton shower, we can simulate the interaction of the particles with the detector and we can finally get to simulated versions of what we think the data would look like. Um, that simulation chain is, of course, built out of software. So we have various tools like MadGraph and Pythia and Jayant that implement this. And we refer to them as Monte Carlo pools because they're all stochastic. And you can think of them as sampling some, from some very high dimensional probability distribution that's like, you know, dictated by the physics of, uh, of you know, what's going on. Uh, and, and, but you can also think of the, the software chain as sampling um, like a Monte Carlo version of a very, very complicated integral. Um, and that integral is basically telling you what does the probability of the data look like given the parameters of the theory. Um, if you actually wanted to evaluate this thing, the likelihood, it's intractable because this integral is like, you know, is a billion dimensional integral and there's no way you're ever going to do that. Um, so you can sample from it, but if you want to do inference, you can't do it in the typical way. This kind of inverse problem is very, very challenging. And so this motivates an entire new class of type of inference techniques where you don't have a tractable likelihood function, but you can just sample synthetic data from your simulation. 
Um, and some people call that likelihood free inference. I refer, I prefer the term simulation based inference. It applies to both Bayesian and frequentist approaches. Um, and it's a very you know, like kind of general purpose abstraction that's uh, relevant for lots of different areas. And so what we're seeing basically is that deep learning and, uh, and the kinds of deep learning that's not just nonlinear regression, uh, but the kinds of things that are a little bit more closely to what you're seeing in generative AI, kind of unsupervised approaches, are uh, very good at taking the simulated data and then learning uh, basically a surrogate for what would have what would have been the totally intractable likelihood function, or or if you're Bayesian, a posterior function. Um, and so you then emulate these statistical quantities and then do statistical inference uh, using the kind of traditional approaches to uh, approaching statistics. Um, and here, really, the expert knowledge is in the simulator is being transferred to these uh, machine learning models uh, through the process of learning. So it's some kind of interesting hybrid between uh, being interpretable and not. Um, and uh, anyways, what we're seeing is by doing that, we can get rid of some engineered summary statistics that sacrifice a lot of power. And we see that the constraints that we have, uh, for instance, this red uh, dash line being reduced to much tighter constraints like the blue uh, ellipse there. And that corresponds to you know, increasing the LHC data by many factors. So this is like a really, really big deal uh, in the field. Um, and this abstraction applies also to cosmology, uh, neuroscience, uh, you know, what's going on with gravitational wave folding, all sorts of different things. And so we're seeing really an explosion in simulation-based inference uh, in all, all different corners of science uh, that's all happened very rapidly. And so this is an area I'm like super duper excited about. And fortunately, you're also seeing an emerging set of software tools to try to make this easier, some of which are very tailored to a context like MadMiner, which really aimed at particle physics, and some which are meant to be much more general purpose. And so, uh, so I'm going to end with that and wrap it up with just kind of this very forward-looking point. Uh, last year, I spent a lot of time on a committee for the uh, uh, National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy to make recommendations about the next 10 years of particle physics and to try to make the case to Congress about why this is a good investment. And, uh, and so one thing that's really, you know, makes me happy to see is that in this report, uh, you see uh, that software and computing data are not kind of afterthoughts. Like they are really now core parts of the scientific enterprise. They're, re they're recognized that way, they're respected. And they are also a very important part of trying to make our case to society about why this is a valuable investment. And the fact that we are kind of have better integration with the, uh, the, what, the rest of what's going on in the scientific Python ecosystem is really important. And so with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll take any questions if you have. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I think we have time for one question, and then there are uh, other questions in the keynotes channel that we can probably address offline. Um, as new research in these large experiments builds off previous results, how do you balance guiding new collaborators into using existing code and resources while allowing these same newcomers to experiment with tools they're already comfortable with and excited to use? Wow, that's that's a great question. I I'm I, I mean maybe I don't know. I don't want you to have to re repeat it, but I think that the point is essentially the balance between uh, using the like well-established tools and things that are uh, and then kind of innovation and trying to come up with new types of uh, new types of tools. Is that essentially the? Yeah. If I heard it right. Well, I think I mean it, it's a it's an excellent question. I mean I think on one side um, we're going that we're going through that transition now and. But we're trying to embrace a more kind of modular approach than something that was previously a bit more monolithic. So that I think that change is making it easier for people to innovate. And if they have a great idea about how to do one of the steps in a in a better way, I think we're making that uh, you know easier to happen. I think we're also trying to make it easier for people that want to come in and contribute to an individual uh, project. We're trying to make that easier. Um, but it is true that, uh, I mean, there's this always this kind of trade-off between uh, using tools that are already kind of well understood and then kind of developing something from scratch because that is a pretty important part of understanding how things work. Um, and that's, I think, a kind of fundamental trade-off, which is part of graduate student training. So I think we, as a field, try to uh, have some tolerance for the fact that people will 
spend some time, you know, reinventing the wheel because that's part of the process of understanding how the wheels work. Um, but it's, I mean, it's an excellent question. I don't think there's a simple answer to it. I think we, we have to take a kind of multi-pronged approach, but when you have thousands of people, that kind of happens naturally. Uh, we maybe have time for a little bit more. Um, in a related sort of theme, often scientists see software as a means to an end and so are less in interested in investing in the software itself. So how do you get buy-in from the uh, high energy physics community to transition away from root to more generalizable and standard tools? Yeah, again, an excellent question. Um, the, uh, I think you know, in this report uh, that I referred to uh, at the end, and we do try to make the case there that uh, that people that are still very much say embedded in the collaborations uh, that are you know maybe have a training either from physics or maybe more on the computing side uh, that they are like absolutely essential to the success of these uh, these experiments and that we need to as a field uh, well a we need funding agencies to recognize that it's okay to put someone on your grant who's going to primarily focus on software. Um, that as a field, we need to embrace those roles of things like research software engineers um, and uh, and uh, and that we need to kind of make that be part of the whole process. And so that, you know, changing the mindset is, is a very slow, slow process, but we've been at it for quite a bit of time. I do think that, you know, there are people that, that have made their names by making contributions to, you know, various kinds of things like I've highlighted, and many of them have gone on to be very successful. So I think the more examples like that that we have, the, the better. Uh, but it's also true that uh, there will, I think, always be a group of people that uh, see software as a means to an end, and, and maybe that's okay. Uh, they don't, not everyone has to contribute to software, but we do need, I think, as a field to uh, recognize and respect the, the importance of those roles. And I think uh, you know, we're not fully through that transition, but I, I think we are making pretty good progress. Great, thanks. And maybe last question uh, out loud. Um, talking about data, in astronomy, most data from raw and hard to work with to reduced and easy to work with are open. Um, in another talk, one of your colleagues mentioned that the data observed and simulated from the 2010s have been released recently. Um, do you think HEP can release experiment data? Yeah, so there, there is a, I mean, it's, that's another really interesting talk. There is, uh, CERN does have an open data portal, um, and uh, even just recently, Atlas put out, uh, I don't remember the exact number, something like 250 terabytes of open data. Um, and some of these studies that I'm talking about um, are, are done on that open data because it's easier to work with collaborators from you know, different fields. So the, the, the collaborations are slowly embracing open data. It's still kind of like a fraction of the data after a fairly long embargo period, uh, which I think is, uh, you know, uh, reasonable for where we are right now. I mean, I'm a huge fan of open data, but I do uh, appreciate that the incentives of trying to get people to do all of the, the work that's maybe not the most fun work to do uh, on the experiments. If, if, if you just made all of the data public, uh, there's, a, there's a concern that everyone would stop investing the time to make the experiments work and they would just use this open data and not kind of contribute to the experiments. And so that's a and that's a real concern. I mean, I think it's also reasonable that the people that put a lot of effort into building and operating the experiments have an embar embargo period to kind of leverage that data to get some scientific results out. Um, you know, there's a, a whole host of different opinions there. Um, so I would say, like in general, you're seeing a move towards open data. There's a bit of a lag between CERN's public uh, attitudes around open data and what's actually being implemented by the experiments. But you know, things are moving in a good direction. Um, my one of the things that I was kind of fighting with for a while was that while I love the idea of open data, the, these things like these, uh, like the likelihood publishing the likelihoods or making the analysis pipelines public are all things that you can do without making the data open, which all have very clear scientific value and the amount of effort to make that work is much, much less. So I've tried to put a lot of emphasis on let's like find targeted types of data products that have a very high scientific value and make sure that we do a very good job of sharing those and then continue working on the long-term goal of making the bulk data open. Got it. Thank you so much. And thank you again for a wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, one more time.
All right, well, thank you for uh, everyone uh, for your contributions to this and all the great work that you're doing. And uh, I, again, I'm sorry that I wasn't there to, uh, uh, to participate in person, but uh, uh, have a great rest of your comments.